The humans have withdrawn their contract for the combat drones, announced Latith, Ideen Defense Systems' liaison officer to the human homeworld. Explain, demanded Aragath, the CEO. Latith shrugged, a mannerism she had picked up from long exposure to the humans. Aragath grimaced but did not comment. Such peculiarities were an occupational hazard for liaison officers and typically indicated that they were good at their job. The combat drone program run by their military has been a failure, she explained. Does this mean that they are terminating all their contracts with us? Gasped Yorlith in alarm. She was the head of R&D and was currently overseeing the development of a multi-billion credit contract to design and produce exosuits for human soldiers, a contract that had the potential to raise her illustrious career to even greater heights. No, they still want all current contracts fulfilled. In fact, they seem eager to expand their business with us, replied Latith. It's just the combat drones project that has failed, and their generals were fairly satisfied that it wasn't our fault. Regardless of whose fault it was, we require further explanation, insisted Aragath. Over two dozen species use our combat drones. We must find out what issues the humans have. This could cause irreparable damage to our stocks. With the board's permission, began Ladith, inserting a data chip into the conference room's projector, I shall outline the main points of our combat drone program with the humans. Ideen Defense Systems was first approached by the human governing body the United Nations, about ten standard years ago to augment their military with combat drones. The plan was the same as all our other drone programs. Augment their frontline infantry with our combat drones to reduce biological casualties and fatalities. Like most species we have worked with, the United Nations ruled out an all-drone army on the grounds that they didn't trust robots acting alone to conduct themselves in accordance with local and galactic laws. We designed the first of the HCD series within a couple of years and began the rollout of a pilot scheme within five years of first being approached. As is our standard practice, we created a species-tailored combat drone built to resemble a baseline of that species. In the case of humans, two legs, two arms, a head atop the torso, the full details are provided in Appendix C of my report. The prototype units, the HCD-1000 model, stood six feet tall, in human measurements, and the head was left blank of any facial features, simply a blank panel covering the sensors and hardware. The idea was a human-like drone could operate their weapons and vehicles without requiring they be modified. It could also wear human camouflage uniforms to blend in better. The prototype units were sent out to frontline units throughout the United Nations military. The UN is engaged against pirates and insurgent groups on a number of battlefields, and we, and the United Nations Security Council, felt these were perfect environments for an initial test of the drones. Of course, we were very confident, as over two dozen species used our drones in everything from law enforcement to full-scale wars, and only the physical configuration of the HCD series was experimental. All the software and programming was battle-tested across the galaxy. The problems began subtly. The UN troops who got the prototypes began to name them and referred to them by these names and not by serial numbers or approved designations. They gave them insignia and unit patches, and some squads painted the chassis to more easily identify different units. We put this down to humans being uncomfortable with the concept of autonomous machines and trying to make them more bearable to look at. We were wrong. After that, we began to notice that all but the most terminally damaged units were repaired and sent back to combat rather than being replaced or recycled. At the time, we put this down to a desire to save money, or misunderstanding of how the units learned. Perhaps the humans believed that the experience gained by a unit was limited to each individual unit. Again, we were wrong. The first serious incident happened with a squad of UN troops combating pirates in the outer reaches. One of their HCD units, HCD-1022, was seriously damaged after breaching a pirate ship and being caught by a booby trap. The unit was damaged almost beyond repair. Regulations stated that damage to that extent meant the unit should be recycled. The entire squad accompanied the remains of the unit to our workshops in their base. When our technicians informed the squad that they'd receive a new model, a number of soldiers became visibly emotional and insisted that they didn't want a new model. They wanted us to fix Logan. Apparently, this was what they called the unit. 
Their use of human pronouns, they called it he and him, not it, should also have tipped off our technicians that something was wrong, but they were using a universal translator and were not well versed in human behavior. Unfortunately, a junior technician told the squad leader that the unit would be recycled, at which point a soldier drew his sidearm and threatened to shoot the technician if he tried to hurt Logan. While his squad leader was able to persuade the soldier to holster his weapon, other members of the squad removed the damaged unit and brought it to human technicians to try and get it repaired. The full details of this incident can be found in Appendix J. We began to canvass the squads involved in the pilot scheme after this incident, and we discovered that the soldiers had formed emotional attachments to the units. All had been named, most had been cosmetically altered to make them appear more individual, and some units had their learning programs altered to allow them to simulate a rapport with the human soldiers. A full list is available in Appendix K, but there are a few particularly noteworthy examples. Many squads uploaded the rules for various ball or card games to their units, and had the units join them in these games during recreation time. A squad that was granted two weeks shore leave took their assigned unit with them against standing orders and several of their photos depicted them engaged in various recreational activities, accompanied by the unit. When questioned, they simply replied that Vakara had worked just as hard as anyone else, again, please note the humanizing language, and she deserved a break as well. However, the most serious incident, listed in Appendix N, was what caused the Security Council to cancel the contract. A UN Light Infantry squad was attacked by a group of insurgents on Rilith, the insurgents took out their HCD unit, HCD-1095, first it being the most serious threat, and the squad were able to take cover behind a building. According to the after-action report, they then had the opportunity to retreat unscathed, but opted instead to go back, into a kill zone of effective enemy fire to rescue the drone. There were sharp intakes of breath throughout the conference room. Ladith continued. Three soldiers died. Four more were seriously injured too badly enough to be discharged on medical grounds. A nearby QRF had to be deployed to pull the squad out, which led to a full-scale firefight with the insurgents. Sixteen civilians died in the crossfire with upwards of thirty injured, all because a squad wouldn't leave a damaged combat drone behind. What did the survivors say? asked Aragath. They said that Cujo had saved each of their lives many times over, and they couldn't just leave him to die. Even with the deaths of 19 biologicals which they expressed regret for, they still didn't seem to think their reasoning had been in error. Dead silence. Their security council held a full investigation. They decided that the advantages of the program were outweighed by recent developments, and it was likely, due to the high durability of the HCD models, that there would be a repeat of the Rileyeth incident, perhaps even worse. They made the decision to cancel the contract, but submitted their full apologies and insisted that we were not at fault. Ladith looked around the room. They still want all the other contracts fulfilled. The exosuits, power armor, new vehicle designs. And they have implied that they may revisit the drone program in some year's time, provided we can design a suitably inhuman drone. Their words. Aragath shook his head. Two dozen species use these drones. They aren't biologicals. They aren't alive. They don't feel anything. They aren't even intelligent. It's just simulated by code. Everyone else understands this. Why can't the humans? Ladith shrugged once again. They tried to explain it to me several times, but I couldn't understand it either, she admitted. It seems to be a trait peculiar to humans. Apparently they call it anthropomorphism. Part 2 I have said it before, and I'll say it again, emphasized Aragath. Two dozen species use our combat drones. He had said little else, thought Ladith, ever since she had returned from Earth with the news that the humans had turned down the contract for iodine defense systems combat drones. So you have said, she replied neutrally. And given that track record, incompatibility with one species surely isn't that bad? If Aragath's expression was anything to go by... It was that bad. His fur stood almost entirely on end, an instinctive stress response intended to make him look bigger and more imposing. He had been CEO of Iodine Defense Systems for twelve standard years, and lived the good life for at least the last ten of them. It just made him look bigger, which Ladith supposed was an achievement in itself. Look, 
Aragath continued. There's more than one human planet, more than one human governing body. They are, after all, a notoriously factional species. Ladith nodded carefully. She knew more about humans than most Inzer did, having been the liaison officer to their United Nations for some years. Yes, the humans were a divided race. By the stars, how many species still had over 200 nation-states on their home world? But for all their division, they had far more in common than not, even if they couldn't always see it themselves. Ladith supposed it sometimes took an outsider to see these things. Aragath was still speaking, outlining his great plan to save the HCD pilot program. So go to one of their colonies. What's that one beside their home world? Maz? Mars? Mars, that's the place. Get to Mars, see if you can't persuade them to take on the combat drone program. Offer them a discount. We have the units designed and prototypes built already. Maybe these humans will prove a bit less emotional. Aragath pronounced the word as if it were profanity. Than their bloody United Nations. And so Ladith found herself on an iodine light transport bound for Mars. The Martian Federal Republic. Why was this planet also divided into semi-independent states? Was there something about unity that the humans were incapable of understanding? Had been contacted with a very attractive proposal, and they had agreed to host Ladith and a small delegation from Ideen. The small ship hurtled past the Sol System's asteroid belt. The so-called planet became barely visible. A speck in the deep black sky passed the viewscreen. Target lock! cried the co-pilot as the console lights began to flash. A mild warning pheromone was released into the cabin. That's just the Martian defense platforms, replied the pilot. It's their standard procedure. Nothing to worry about. Sure enough, the radio crackled into life almost immediately. Unidentified vessel on bearing 3,800. This is Martian traffic control. Identify yourself. Even through the radio and the universal translator, the calm, clipped tones of an aerospace traffic controller were the same the universe over. Martian traffic control, this is IDS Sables. Trade delegation from Idine Defense Systems to meet with the Martian Defense Council. There was a momentary pause while the transport's computer and the traffic control computer exchanged information, and presumably while the human tried to correctly pronounce Sables. Acknowledged Sables, we're sending you a flight path. You're landing on Pad 3 in the Perseverance Valley spaceport. Please do not deviate from the flight path. Roger, Control, the pilot replied. Many thanks. So, asked Thrull, Ladith's assistant, do you think these Martians will go for the combat drones? I don't know, Ladith admitted. She had thought it over ever since leaving the Idine offices on Inzura and still hadn't come to a solid conclusion. Honestly, they could go either way. The Martians are known to be more militant than the United Nations, even though they haven't expanded past Mars. Thrull's brows furrowed in confusion. Ladith explained before he could voice the question. Mars was a desert, completely inhospitable. They colonized it before they developed their FTL drives, and it took centuries for them to properly establish themselves. They still haven't terraformed the planet. So the UN used the FTL drives, took off, and expanded to other colonies, while the Martians eked out a living for themselves. The Martians were apparently concerned that the UN would simply annex them. So once they'd sorted out a self-sufficient food and water supply, they poured credits and development into their military, but didn't expand out past their moons. Ladith gestured out the view screen at Phobos as the transport powered past it. So they built up their ships, their weapons, their soldiers, the whole works. They have one of the best military forces in the sector, and they did it all themselves. They've never had a contract with us or any other defense supplier. They prefer Martian technology. So there's a possibility they'll turn us down on the basis of us not being Martian. But they might also say yes. Well, they are more military-minded as a people than the United Nations are. More logical, less sentimental from what I hear. I've never been to Mars before, just heard about them from the humans in the UN. They seem to regard Martians as cold, logical, and nigh emotionless, not, I imagine, the sort to form attachments with machines. That sounds promising, Thrull mused aloud. Perhaps this obsession with machines is purely an Earth thing. I hope so, 
replied Ladith as the transport began its final descent towards Perseverance Valley Spaceport. I really hope so. Ladith had to credit the Martians. They had spared no expense and cut no corners when it came to the defense of their homeworld. Weapons platforms bristling with sensors, missiles, and point defense weapons lazily meandered through the planet's high orbit. The immense Orion shipyard stood out above them all. Battleships and cruisers docked to her sides like puppies suckling at their mother. Yet more cruisers and one battleship, the MRN Ares, pride of the Martian home defense fleet, prowled along the space lanes over the Red Planet. Ladith had kept one eye on the computer's early warning system, and at no point since they passed the asteroid belt had there been less than twenty active weapon locks on their transport. Having seen the weapons trained on them, Ladith had no doubt that even one of those locks would be more than sufficient to wipe their transport from the skies. Seeing the near obsession with which these Martians defended their home, her hopes began to grow that they would adopt the combat drones program. Flanked by two Mercury-class fighters, the Seavils descended through the thin Martian atmosphere. Mild winds buffeted the craft as the impressive expanse of the Perseverance Valley spaceport spread out before it. With a gravity of less than half the human homeworld, Mars could facilitate much larger spacecraft, and the size of the landing pads showed it. The two Mercury-class fighters peeled off as the point defense guns of Perseverance swiveled in their cradles to track the transport. Latith was fairly certain there were active war zones with less stringent landing procedures. Any species that goes in for this much overkill has to love the combat drones, enthused Throol, clearly coming to the same conclusion as Latith. Perhaps, she replied, moving towards the transport's doors as the craft touched down. She and Thrull busied themselves with their helmets and breathing equipment. Full spacesuits were no longer necessary on Mars, but the air was still too thin and poor in oxygen for carbon-based life to breathe. The doors hissed open, and Ladith and Thrull walked out onto the Martian surface. The immense dome of Perseverance Valley Spaceport Visitors Terminal towered above even the largest ships parked on the pads, and both headed for the entrance at a quick walk. As the terminal doors opened, the first thing Ladith saw was the large customs checkpoint just inside. The second thing she saw was the two Martians in armored bodysuits, matte black visors obscuring their faces entirely. Just like the combat drones, she thought. Excellent. Ah, hello, called a voice, and an official-looking human in what seemed to be formal attire hurried over. You are Latith, are you not? The iodine representative? The human who introduced himself as Secretary Hobbin, expedited their passage through the customs checkpoint, with them only needing to show the blank-helmed soldiers their identity cards before being waved through. They followed Hobbin through the impressive halls of the terminal, while he chatted happily about Mars and their eagerness to discuss potential contracts with Ideen. Ladith had to work hard to suppress her grin. The combat drone contract was as good as signed. Ah... Hobbin exclaimed as they rounded a corner into an imposing central atrium. One of our most important Martian landmarks. Please, please see for yourselves. Ladith stepped forward with a sinking feeling as she took in the scene. The atrium was enormous, the ceiling reaching to the roof of the dome itself, the reddish hue of soul shining down on them. Against the far wall, a sign proclaimed, Welcome to Perseverance Valley Spaceport, with a massive Martian flag hanging above it. Five smaller flags, which she recognized as belonging to some of the United Nations member states, were arrayed beneath it. But that was not what concerned her. In the center of the room was a massive plinth, made of roughly excavated red Martian rock. A glass box around the plinth protected the display from dust, dirt, and over-eager visitors. On the plinth stood what looked like a medium-sized unmanned vehicle with six wheels, each on independent suspension. Solar panels sat like insect wings on its back, and a camera array protruded from a mast on the front. Various antenna and manipulator claws were attached to the main body. The vehicle was clearly ancient, but incredibly well-maintained, the solar panels still soaking in the light of the Martian sun. Before the plinth stood a plaque. With a sense of deep foreboding, Latith stepped forward and read the inscription, Mars Exploration Rover. B. Opportunity. 8-7-2003 to 10-6-2018. My battery is low and it's getting dark. A sniff from behind made her start, 
and she turned to see Secretary Hobbin wiping his eyes on a sleeve. I'm sorry. He apologetically gestured towards the plinth. Oppie's last words, they always get to me. He smiled sadly, then gestured towards a pair of double doors on the far side of the atrium. Shall we meet the Defense Council? If you want to learn more about Oppie and the Mars missions, I can give you a full tour of the museum later on. Latith followed Hayden with a growing sense of despondence. These Martians were no less susceptible to this trait of anthropomorphism then 